Hello, and welcome everybody to the National Trends in Disability Employment, or NTIDE, Lunch and Learn series. Just a few housekeeping items before we begin. This webinar is being recorded. We will post an archive of each webinar each month on our website at www.researchondisability.org slash NTIDE. This site will also provide copies of the presentations, the speakers' bios, full transcripts, and other valuable resources. As an attendee of this webinar, you are a viewer. To ask questions of the speakers, click on the Q&A box on your webinar screen and type your questions into the box. Speakers will review these questions and provide answers during the last section of the webinar. Some questions may be answered directly in the Q&A box. If you have any questions following this recording, please contact us at disability.statistics at unh.edu or toll free at 866-538-9521 for more information. Thanks for joining us. Enjoy, Enjoy today's, today's webinar. webinar. Hi, everybody. This is Andrew Houghtonville from the University of New Hampshire's Institute on Disability. Um, welcome to the, uh, the September. It's September NTIDE. Um, the NTIDE Lunch and Learn happens every noon uh, on the first Friday of the uh, month, coinciding with the release of the uh, jobs report by the Bureau of Labor Statistics. The Lunch and Learn is a a joint collaboration with the uh, UNH Institute on Disability, the Kessler Foundation, and the Association of Centers on Disability. And TIDE is part, also part of the Rehabilitation Research and Training Center on Employment Policy and Measurement, funded by the National Institute on Independent and Living, National Institute on Disability, Independent Living, and Rehabilitation Research, NIDLER. So they're the funders of this uh, effort. Um, John O'Neill, the first part, we'll be talking about the NTIDE report results. John O'Neill uh, uh, is out today, so I'm going to be doing both parts. Then we'll follow that by uh, NTIDE news from Denise Rizal from AUCD. And then we have a guest speaker, uh, Robin from the Kessler Family, Kaiser Family Foundation. And then we'll follow it up with Q&A, as we mentioned before. Uh, so the first part. Uh, the NTIDE results. So the NTIDE is a monthly report. Uh, we do a press release and we do an infographic about the latest statistics. Uh, it coincides with the release of the job report. So you probably heard about how the economy is doing. We're still at full employment. Um, it's a, the NTIDE report itself is a joint effort of Kessler Foundation and UNH. Um, the source of information for today's uh, statistics and, and also for the jobs report itself um, is the Bureau of Labor Statistics uh, Current Population Survey. Uh, it's the source of the official unemployment rate. Uh, we're gonna look at civilians ages 16 to 64. Uh, the, they first started collecting disability-related statistics in September 2008 and onward. Uh, we're not yet seasonally adjusting, uh, which is why we compare, um, uh, we're gonna compare August of 2018 to August of 2017. So we always compare it to the prior year, so that takes out some of the seasonal effects. Uh, so the numbers, let's see. So the numbers are good overall. Uh, we see a slight rise in the employment rate of people with disabilities up for, from 29.5% 20, 20, in August of 2017 to 3.2%. Um, so that's about a 0.7 percentage points and two uh, two and a half percent uh, increase. Uh, the employment of people without disabilities also went up, although more slightly, only up uh, two tenths of a of a percentage point. Um, that's only up uh, 0.3 percent. Labor force participation rate is also something we like to look at. Uh, that's the percentage of people who are not only working, but also uh, it adds in people who are actively looking for work in the last month. Uh, this number um, increase for people with disabilities from 32.5 to 33 uh, percent. Um, that's up about uh, a half a percentage point. And for people without disabilities, it also um, uh, it actually went down a little bit. Um, 
uh, three tenths of a percentage point. And so, uh, uh, you know, this is kind of interesting that it goes down slightly for people without disabilities, but up slightly for people with disabilities. Um, and so that's actually a nice sign, although these numbers are quite, these, these changes are quite small. Uh, so it's not indicative of a huge shift uh, in the economy or the labor market. Um, we like to look at every month the, the employment to population ratio trend. And um, what you can see is the, you know, the data was first started to collect. These are the first years that the first time they, they officially published them. That was uh, September 2008. And you can see the, the kind of the Great Recession. That's kind of towards the height of the Great Recession. Uh, and you see the decline. Um, but you also see, you know, so for people with disabilities, you see this steady march upwards, um, you know, after, say, uh, 2000, uh, uh, after the, the turn from 2009 to 2010, you see an increase. For people with disabilities, that increase really didn't start until, say, you know, I would actually say around 2005, 2006. And over the last two years and into, the, into 2008, we've actually seen this rise uh, in employment. Um, so that's employment to population ratio is the percentage of people who are working. And so this continues to be a very good sign for the economy and for people with disabilities. Um, and, uh, you know, the last two months, um, you know, we really kind of saw some softening uh, for people with disabilities uh, when you compare it to the same time last year. Um, but uh, this uh, continues, uh, this kind of gives us a little hope that the last two months were only a little bit of an aberration. Uh, and so um, we're kind of looking forward to see if this continues to rise. You know, the main hypothesis uh, that's going on is that the, as the economy is in full employment, people with disabilities um, are, uh, are, firms are looking for employees and so may, um, may reach out to people with disabilities or organizations that uh, that represent people with disabilities and or support people with disabilities. And also, you know, as jobs open up nearby your home, uh, the barriers of travel uh, and barriers related to the types of jobs that are available might be going down. And so people with disabilities may be more likely to venture into the labor market given that those barriers may not be there. Also, there's, uh, we don't have the ability to do wages uh, in the data that, that, uh, that uh, is used here. Um, but there is evidence, um, I just heard from a grad student that uh, wages went up uh, around 2.4% um, in, the, in the overall economy uh, compared to last year. And uh, that would be a really great sign um, uh, if, we're at, you know, I, uh, he's my re research assistant and we're going to try to see if there's a way to, to grab wages out of, out of any of the available data. Um, but uh, may take a while before we're able to do that if we indeed are. So with that, I'm going to turn, these are the results. We're going to answer questions. Again, use the Q&A box if you have any specific questions. I may be able to answer them um, uh, uh, in the Q&A box itself, uh, but I will answer them. If I don't, I'll answer them at the end of the session. Um, I see there's one question. I'll try to answer that one uh, uh, via text. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Denise, and, uh, and it's all yours. Terrific. Let's, oh, let's do this. One of the, okay. go back to the poll. Let's talk about the poll for a second. One of the things that we are doing is um, mm -hmm. trying to see what it is you're liking um, best, what topics you'd like us to do next. Um, so we are doing a poll. Uh, please go ahead and take the poll if you joined it on Facebook Live. You can say something in the chat icon if you want. There's a whole list of possible topics. If you have something else you'd like to hear from us, uh, we're beginning to plan for next year's um, for next year's sessions and end tides. So please let us know what you'd like to hear about. We want to make sure we hit what you want to know. And then next slide, Andrew. Um, the other thing is is we're asking about, and you can do this by clicking the poll icon if you're on. Um, if you're not on Facebook Live, if you're on Facebook Live, you can put in the chat. So which part of the end tide do you, do you like the most, or find the most interesting? The part that is- My part. Of course, Andrew, I knew you'd say that. 
Andrew's part, like there. what he just did. You can put, the, you can put your comments in the Q&A to or, or anywhere, really. Exactly. Chat. It's fine. Wherever you want to get it to us, that would be great. So there's the, the numbers part, which is what Andrew just did. There's the news from the field, which is what I'm about to do. Um, guest panelists is uh, today, that would be Robin, the kind of 15-minute um, presentation by someone getting a little bit more in-depth into an issue. And then the interviewees. We do not actually have an interviewee today, but that's the interview that I generally do with a person with a uh, disability who is working. And then the question and answer period, that's pretty self-explanatory. So if we would really love to have you get back to us, let us know what it is you find most interesting and what you would like to hear from us as we move forward. Okay, next slide, Andrew. Okay, and next slide. So let's talk, I think the next one, there it is, the federal policy update. So let's just talk about a couple of things. I always like to give you a few things that are going on in Washington. Um, the appropriations, the Senate, I think I told you last month, the Senate was about to pass. They did. They passed the appropriations for defense and for labor, health, and human services. Most of the money that um, folks on this call care about is in the labor HHS bill. Um, so it was passed. It's very straightforward. It's what we expected to see. Um, it does not put in the cuts that the administration was recommending. It rather goes with the things we've been seeing from the Senate for quite some time. Um, it went with the committee bill, basically. And I've talked to you about that before. Um, pretty much the disability programs have been refunded across the board, with the exception of, um, I think, the supported employment program under the VR programs. That one took a hit. Everything else has been either level funded or increased, um, which is kind of surprising, frankly, not what we necessarily expected. Um, I wanted to put the heads up bill on here because somebody asked me about it last month and I said I would do some checking and get back to you. So it's HR 6611. It's co-sponsored um, by uh, Representative Seth Moulton from Massachusetts, who's a Democrat, and Greg Harper from Mississippi, who is a Republican. And basically, it's a bill that would amend the Public Health Service Act to recommend, um, to recognize that intellect individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities um, are a medically underserved population. That would significantly expand and improve services at health centers for people with DD. And that's something we've been asking for for a long time. Um, it's not going anywhere at the moment, and quite frankly, I'm not sure it will go anywhere this year, given that it's September. But what they're doing right now is looking for co-sponsors. So if this is something that you're really interested in, I would reach out to your congressperson um, and tell them that you're interested and you'd like to see them co-sponsor it. Because that way, if they have a lot of co-sponsors that come on before the end of this year, when it comes up again next year, which I'm sure it will, um, they already start ahead. So that's for whoever asked that question last month that I couldn't answer, there's the answer. Um, next, I want to let you know that money follows the person, so the Empower Care Act, and there's the, um, it's S2227 or HR5306, had a hearing yesterday, which went really well, well attended, lots of people talking about money follows the person. Um, there is still hope that that's something that might be passed in a lame duck session. Um, or add it on to another piece of legislation. It's bipartisan. People think we should continue the Money Follows program um, to help people get out of institutions and be employed and work and live in the community. Um, we'll see if it actually happens. But again, that's another one where they're looking for co-sponsors. So if you wanna do something, that would be what you could do is contact your senator or, or representative to say that you would like to see them co-sponsor this. But they did have a hearing yesterday and it was well attended and went really well. Um, I'm going to skip the Supreme Court for just one minute and come back to it. Um, the other one I added on here, because I don't know that I've talked about this in recent days. Um, and again, they're looking for co-sponsors. As I've said before, most things are not moving. It's September. Congress has enough to do before now and when they go home to run for re-election, um, including the Kavanaugh hearings and other things. So um, it's not like they're going to be passing some of these bills, but to the extent we can keep them on the radar for next year, it's important. The Disability and Integration Act, and there's um, HR 2472 and S910. It's more or less what used to be Mikasa, if you know Mikasa. Um, it requires government, the government and insurers to cover home and community-based services. It's bipartisan. Um, 
lots of the community and frankly all of the community is behind it um, it's another place that you just some it's a bill you should be aware of now i want to come back to the supreme court for just a minute um, and and i want to be real clear i don't i'm not sure it matters for what i'm about to say whether you are pro or con um, judge kavanaugh whether where you are on the political spectrum i want you to know that today right now as a matter of fact i had to turn off what i was watching the live Supreme Court coverage to come talk to you. Um, Liz Weintraub, who has been a guest on um, this show, on um, The Untied Lunch and Learn, and who also is um, the host of Tuesdays with Liz, a weekly um, Facebook Live uh, broadcast about policy issues for people with intellectual disabilities. Um, Liz herself is a woman with an intellectual disability. Liz just testified before the Senate Judiciary Committee um, on the Judge Kavanaugh nomination. Um, her testimony, I'm sure, will be all over social media. She was trending on Twitter, which we are really excited about. Um, and I urge you to go look at it. It is an incredibly powerful thing to see a woman with an intellectual disability testifying before the Judiciary Committee on a Supreme Court nomination, which I'm not sure has ever happened before for the disability community talking about um, rights of self-determination and nothing about us without us. It was an incredibly strong testimony. I urge everyone to go see it. And um, that's enough, but it, it was fabulous. Um, they are still asking questions right now unless they've adjourned, but um, I urge you to go see it. It was terrific. Okay, um, next slide, Andrew. Now to move on to stuff that's going on in the field. I have shared with you guys before some of the things, the recommendations that are out there for how the American Job Center can do better with employing people with disabilities. There are a variety of things that have come out that say, you know, you can do certain things because they are required to do a better job um, under WIOA, the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act. This is a new piece specifically targeted to neurodiversity. And I like it a lot because it was written, it's put out, published by the LEAD Center and ODEP, and it was put out specifically written by Kelly Israel and Samantha Crane from ASAN, the Autism Self-Advocate Network. So this is coming specifically from self-advocates, and it's recommendations on how employers can better serve people with neurodiversity in the workplace. None of these are going to be surprises to the people on the call who have worked with, um, with people with neurodiversity. But having said that, having this come out, I think is a really strong statement. It talks about um, you know, supports, it talks about customized employment, kind of introduces the concept of customized employment for those who, employers and AJCs who may not be familiar with them. Um, recommends hiring and training people with disabilities as employees in the AJCs. Um, talks about uh, suggestions for non-speaking job seekers. I really like that one too because we don't talk enough about folks who may not communicate through speech. And there are some recommendations there about typing and folks, folks who type or write or use um, other types of assisted communication. Um, talks about adapting intake and training procedures, giving varieties of types of ways to access those and varieties of ways to access job fairs, apprenticeships, all of that. So I really recommend this one. This is another one, uh, particularly if you're working in the autism world, or if you are working directly with AJCs, this would be a nice one to print out and take in to your AJC, whether you work with folks in the autism community or not, so that they have them, um, they have it on hand. Okay, next, Andrew. The, I've got a couple of things here because we're gonna to get to our speaker today is gonna to be talking about Medicaid and employment. So I have a couple of things um, out there that I thought you might wanna know, and then she's gonna talk about work requirements in Medicaid. But there's a, this is another one that I think you might just want to hold on to. It's on the role of Medicaid in supporting employment. It's a basic piece. Um, it's one of those things to stick in your file. If somebody says, I don't understand how Medicaid can support employment. Medicaid is healthcare. I don't understand. This one is just really straightforward. It's a little wonky. Um, but if you're handing it to somebody, uh, I'm not sure it would be the best one for a parent. Um, unless you've got a wonky parent. So that was probably, that's a wrong thing to say. Lots of parents I know could use this one. I'm going to take back exactly what I just said. Um, it's a good one though. 
So it's put up by MACPAC, which is the Medicaid and Chip Payment Access Commission. So it's official, it's a government thing. Um, it talks about um, it, it, exactly what I just said, the role of Medicaid in supporting employment. Um, these are existing ways that Medicaid can already support employment without implementing the work requirements as a condition of eligibility. Robin, when she speaks, is gonna talk about the work requirements. This is, you can do it without even requiring work as a part of the Medicaid system. Um, so that's important. Next one, Andrew. The next one I've got is also around Medicaid and, and um, employment. This one is a new article in the American Journal of Public Health. It's gotten some press, and I know there's some other data coming out around this as well, about Medicaid expansion and employment. So uh, Medicaid expansion as an employment incentive. When Medicaid was expanded under the ACA, and we've talked about this a little bit, um, that expansion population has some things that are special about it. Um, they don't have to go through a straight disability determination. They don't have to show an inability to work. Um, they don't have the asset test. Um, they can get more income. So if you fall under the expansion population, you just have to meet the, um, the income requirement. That's it. So what you're seeing is some increased employment for people with disabilities who are living in Medicaid expansion states. Um, and the quote that I really liked, again, from the, from the paper is, in effect, Medicaid expansion coverage is acting as an employment incentive program for people with disabilities. Nice finding, something we can use. Like I said, I know there's more data coming out on it. I think Mathematica's doing a study around this one as well. We'll bring it to you when you see it. Next one, Andrew. Um, I tend to try to bring you stuff around disability and poverty. Um, this one is out of Cornell um, on the impact of participation in school to work on post-secondary outcomes for youth with disabilities in low-income families, so youth who are in households receiving welfare. And, um, and you, know, you can see there are implications and recommendations there for future research, um, higher rates of employment, lower rates of conviction, lower wages. I'm not sure about that one. Somebody needs to go read and explain to me why that happened. I've told you before, I'm not the research geek in the group. I'm the policy geek, but that one I have, I, I don't get that one, but, um, but that's one of the findings. So I urge folks to go look at this one, figure it out for yourself. As I say, it's out of Cornell, and it's actually out of some of the folks at Cornell who are also working on the Promise Grant, um, and you've heard from Promise folks on this call in the past. So I wanted to raise this one for you. Next slide, Andrew. Um, this one is, there you go, on implementation of self-directed services. This one also ties back into um, DD services in the states. It was based on interviews with 34 or 42 state DD directors who provide self-direction programs in their DD programs. Um, so for people with ID in their states. And it looks at some of the strengths and challenges and suggestions. Self-determination programs um, are really widely used, obviously. We do still have some challenges, but the increased opportunity for folks with disabilities, um, because of the increase in self-determination opportunities, I think is really important. We have some work to do on those, there are some suggestions. And I think, and for states who don't have one, I think this is another really interesting one. And then lastly, Andrew, I was, next slide, there you go. I wanna promote this. Um, for anyone who hasn't heard about Intelligent Lives, Intelligent Lives, and you can go to intelligentlives.org there's a website, um, there's a link here as well as the le website is listed. Intelligent Lives is Dan Habib's newest film. Um, it premiered in Massachusetts not too long ago. Dan is with the University of, of New Hampshire, so plug for you guys. I've seen it, it's really good. Um, it's gonna have its DC premiere uh, the end of the month, September 26th, here in DC. I don't know if people are gonna be in DC, but any of you who are local, please come. There's a congressional hearing that day on, um, as you can see, successes of youth with disabilities transitioning from school to competitive integrated employment. It's co-sponsored by um, the National Council on Disability and um, CPSD, co-sponsored also by Senator Hassan from New Hampshire, Casey from Pennsylvania, um, Representative Moulton from Massachusetts, Langevin from Rhode Island, uh, Representative Harper. There's a whole panel of folks. 
both parents and individuals with disabilities in competitive integrated employment. Dan is on the panel as well. And, um, and I hope they'll give, you can watch on C-SPAN or something like that, or it'll be up on C-SPAN later. I would hope because it is a congressional briefing. You should be able to find it, if not live, then later. Um, and then some state folks about from Delaware and Wisconsin about how they are working on uh, competitive integrated employment. And then the DC reception and launch um, premiere of the film itself is gonna be at the National Press Club, late, Club later, um, sponsored by the Taisha Center at Syracuse. And um, they're gonna have not just some of the students who are in the film, but also some of the current students at Inclusive U are going to be here. And they're also gonna be doing Hill visits that day. So we're really excited to host them as well. Um, I urge you to go. I urge you to go up on the Intelligent Live site. Um, it's a, Intelligent Live, I say that earlier and I should have, is um, a film that explores kind of how the segregation of people with intellectual disabilities became the norm um, on intelligence tests and those kinds of things, why it's being dismantled, and then how some people with IDD are basically blazing a new path um, and that's where some of the folks from the film, um, Micah Feldman is one, and he's going to be on, um, he's going to be here as well speaking about it. So I really, if you're going to be in DC, come. If not, you can watch it on C-SPAN. Go to the website, look it up. It's a really cool film. And, and if you don't know Dan, you should go look at some of the other things he's done. Um, you might know him from, um, including Samuel. That was a really popular documentary he did on including his son Samuel in um, education and employment. So really good and I'm thrilled to give a plug to, uh, to them. I think, let's see, I think that's the end of mine, Andrew. All right, let's flip that one. And I get to, an, oh, save the date. No, it isn't. Ah, uh, yeah. Yeah, another important one, save the date. This is for the um, State of the Science meeting on February 12th and the, ans the annual disability statistics compendium on the, on the 13th here in DC at the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine. And if Andrew wants to say more about that, he can. This it's is, awesome, that's all I'll say. It is awesome. And I've been, and it's a really good turnout and a really good conversation about the state of the science on disability statistics. And it's what I really like about it, again, I'm the policy geek. What I really like about it is the way that it mixes policy, practice, and statistics. Um, we all need to be talking together about all of that, so fabulous. Okay, let me introduce our speaker. Go ahead to the next slide, Andrew. Um, our speaker today is Robin Rudowitz. I am thrilled to have Robin here. She is the Associate Director of the Program on Medicaid and the Uninsured at Kaiser, the Kaiser Family Foundation. Um, she works on Medicaid financing issues, uh, Medicaid and the Affordable Care Act, and um, you'll see, you'll hear more about all of that in a minute. Um, prior to Kaiser, Robin was the senior manager at the Lewin Group, a health policy and consulting firm. Um, she's worked on budget and health policy issues in a variety of different federal agencies as well. Everything from CMS and the Office of Legislation. Uh, she was the, uh, in the chief financial officer for the District of Columbia, the Congressional Budget Office, and the Ways and Means for the National, the New York State Assembly. So she's been state, uh, federal, policy, inside, outside, um, all kinds of things on Medicaid finance. And I'm thrilled that she is here to talk about the new work requirements, Medicaid and work. So Robin, I'm gonna toss it to you. Um, great, thanks so much for having me. And of course, I'm filling in as the the slide says for my colleague, Mary Beth Musumichi, who is not feeling well today. So I will do my best, but we both um, focus on Medicaid waivers a lot. Um, so, and certainly the focus on Medicaid and work requirements um, has come up um, a lot lately. Many states are um, pursuing these waivers with the administration and um, uh, I will talk about what we have in terms of what the what's going on across the states and um, what we have in terms of publications and data. Um, so on the first slide, um, it's just a little bit of an overview, next slide, um, uh, of what these Section 1115 waivers are. Um, so 
Um, under the Medicaid law, uh, you, states cannot impose work requirements, and that was discussed before, as a condition of eligibility. Um, so states are seeking these Medicaid work requirements as um, through these waivers. So under Section 1115 of the Social Security Act, the secretary can waive compliance with um, certain provisions of the Medicaid law if the states are trying to do something experimental or they're um, implementing a demonstration project that importantly are likely to assist in promoting the objectives of the Medicaid program, um, not by statute, but over long-standing policy, these uh, 1115 waivers are supposed to be budget neutral to the federal government, so they can't cost the federal government any more than they would have without the waiver. Um, and under rules put in place under the ACA, there are new transparency rules, so um, waivers are subject to state and federal comment periods. Um, waivers have been around and used for a long time. Um, each administration really has some discretion over waivers to approve and what waivers they want to encourage in terms of policy direction but that discretion is, um, is not unlimited. Um, the Trump administration issued new waiver guidance um, back in November in terms of criteria of what types of waivers would be approved. Importantly, in that list of criteria, there was no longer a criteria that included increased coverage. Um, and then in January of 2018, uh, the administration issued new guidance um, that really um, gave the rationale for moving ahead with um, work or community engagement requirements um, and immediately following the issuance of that waiver they approved um, a work requirement as well as a number of other provisions in Kentucky. Um, in June of this year the a DC federal uh, district court invalidated the Kentucky waiver um, uh, importantly, citing that it did not consider the impact on providing um, coverage. So um, that was invalidated and the state was told they could not go ahead with implementing, um, implementing that waiver. So there's a lot going on um, in terms of uh, both the policy direction and what's happening um, at the state level. Um, so next slide um, shows really the breadth of what's happening in terms of um, these uh, 1115 demonstration waivers. There is a lot of activity. We're tracking these on this, uh, we call it our waiver tracker. So we're tracking what waivers are um, pending and approved across the states. You can see that across 37 states, there are 45 um, approved waivers, and across 23 states, there are 24 pending waivers. Um, we're tracking them in these um, various areas, so work being um, one of them, but I'll also point out that, um, uh, you know, what you probably know that states are uh, also interested in pursuing a uh, waiver, and there's a lot of waiver activity around behavioral health um, issues as well but that's for a different discussion on a different day. Um, so on the next slide, um, it breaks out uh, the work, um, uh, next slide, yeah, um, shows where these work requirements are um, approved and pending. So right now, there are approved work requirement waivers in Arkansas, Indiana, and New Hampshire. Arkansas it was the first state to actually implement um, the work requirement and they began phasing in those requirements starting June 1st and we'll talk a little bit about some of the findings um, of what's happening in Arkansas in a little bit. There are a number of states, so eight states have waivers pending at CMS, so they've submitted an application. Um, and um, of course, Kentucky we have as uh, that one was approved by CMS, but then subsequently invalidated by the court. I would note that um, this map and what our waiver tracker shows is what's happening in terms of submission to CMS. There are a number of other states that are um, looking at this at the state level, um, maybe developing waivers. So the, I think the activity is more widespread. Um, but those waivers just have not been formally, um, you know, uh, submitted to, to CMS. So, and also these waivers and the requests 
are looking both across expansion and non-expansion populations. So in some states like Mississippi, um, South Dakota, Kansas, the income eligibility for Medicaid is very low. Um, so there, you're talking um, about very low income um, individuals who are eligible for Medicaid subject to the work requirement. Next slide. Um, so by design um, and, uh, you know, what our data show are that the large majority of Medicaid adults, um, and this is looking at adults who are not qualifying for Medicaid on the basis of disability, so non-SSI, non-dual eligible um, Medicaid adults, about 6 in 10 are already working. And then when you look at the data among those who are not working, the largest share of those who are not working cite um, as their as illness or disability for the main reason of why they might not be working. Um, we know from other data that many individuals who are not working have um, a variety of physical limitations. They'll cite pain, um, difficulty bending, pushing or pulling or sitting or standing as some of the physical limitations, and these might be limitations to getting um, a job as well as other um, mental limitations that um, may uh, make it difficult for them to work. Um, when states are setting these up, they say, oh, well, many are already working, or they would just be exempt, um, so they wouldn't be subject to the work requirement. But, you know, when we look at this pie, so there's only this very small slice, that 6% who might be subject to the work requirement, but we'll come back to this later, too, that it really these requirements affect all adults who might be subject um, or in the group potentially subject to them because individuals who are working um, or who may be exempt would still need to potentially report their work status or to navigate an exemption process. Um, so, which could present administrative difficulties, um, which could also lead to, uh, um, to loss in coverage. We know, um, next slide, from some other data, um, looking more broadly at Medicaid adults, um, that about 30% of Medicaid adults um, have a disability, um, and the large majority, so nearly 6 in 10 of those who um, have a disability, do not have SSI. So again, if individuals with SSI are automatically exempt, that still leaves a lot of um, individuals who may have a disability who could be subject um, to these new requirements. Next slide. Um, so we've done a lot of work of trying to um, look at data around this intersection of Medicaid and work. Um, we know that um, the occupations with the largest number of um, workers who are covered by Medicaid, um, they're working in very low paying jobs that often do not have benefits. Um, so cashiers, um, home health aides, uh, you know, servers and restaurants. Um, so these are jobs that are also sometimes physically demanding, so would be difficult for um, individuals with physical limitations to even obtain some of these jobs. We also know, next slide, um, that many individuals on Medicaid working or non-working, um, which is, uh, true because they are um, low income, but they do face a lot of financial insecurity. So about half um, have um, say that they're worried about paying their bills. Many are also worried about, um, you know, having stable housing. Um, and um, so there's a lot of financial insecurity among those who are working and non-working. And next slide. Um, we also looked at computer, internet, and email usage, um, and a large share of um, adults covered by the Medicaid program do not use a computer, um, and this has implications for both finding a job, but also um, have uh, implications for doing some of the reporting, like these uh, requirements for creating an uh, email account and logging on to log hours, like what the requirements are in Arkansas. Um, next slide. <clears throat> we also note that um, the, it, under the ACA, there was a move to, um, you know, prior to the ACA, there was a lot of uh, eligibility was uh, complicated. 
Um, so individuals needed often to apply in person, have a lot of paperwork, and it took a long time. I think in addition to expanding eligibility under the ACA, there was also a major streamlining simplification and coordination um, to, uh, as part of the ACA requirements that had to take place in all states. Um, even states that didn't adopt the expansion to simplify their systems and reduce the amount of paperwork for individuals um, applying for coverage. And some of these waivers like um, and waiver provisions, the work requirements among them, would lead to more documentation and more frequent reporting, um, which again we know um, has implications for, um, for loss of coverage. Next slide. Um, so a lot of that um, information um, played into another analysis that we did when we um, looked at various scenarios um, uh, projecting coverage loss um, for individuals who are subject uh, to the work requirement. And under all of the scenarios that we looked at, it, um, the, our uh, analysis showed that more adults would lose coverage because of red tape or um, problems meeting administrative uh, requirements or um, like reporting um, than those who would lose eligibility for not meeting um, or not complying with a new work requirement. Um, and if you think about that pie, that's because there's so many more people um, in those groups um, and uh, according to the, you know, lots of research that we looked at, again, when you look at things like redeterminations and new, um, more frequent redeterminations and imposition of paperwork and navigating processes, that usually does relate, uh, result in some type of um, coverage loss. So we, this is not projections of, you know, exactly what would happen because the requirements are different, but a range of scenarios um, show that that um, is a potential effect related to um, to these administrative complications. And we are seeing some of this next slide play out in Arkansas. Um, so again, Arkansas was the first state to begin implementation of a work requirement. Um, they're phasing it in um, starting in June was the uh, first cohort of um, or first group to be subject. And under the work requirement in Arkansas, individuals who fail to comply um, with the requirements as well as the reporting for three months um, uh, lose coverage. Um, and September marked the third month, and we know from additional reporting that 45, uh, about 4,500 uh, enrollees have lost coverage, and they cannot reapply for coverage and gain coverage back until January. Um, we're doing some more in-depth analysis um, of um, what's happening there, um, but you know, anecdotally, and what was reported. Um, in the papers is that despite efforts um, by the state to reach out and plans to try to reach um, people to let them know about not only the new requirements, but the obligations to set up these accounts and do the reporting, it's hard to reach people and many are not um, aware of the new requirements. Um, so among those um, individuals, many may um, still be eligible for coverage, but might um, not have reported that they were working or that they might have an exemption. So I think as these um, states continue to show interest um, and as the administration continues to um, promote these um, work requirements um, and uh, states are interested, there are a few things that um, and key questions that people with disabilities um, um, or, you know, there are these key questions that you should be aware of. I guess one of them is there's uh, general exemptions for um, the medically frail. Um, so there are lots of questions about how medical frailty um, will be determined. Um, I think you know states have some uh, flexibility on that definition. Um, and not only the definition, but um, I think there are other things about even once you have a definition, how is that communicated? How easy it is to report? How often individuals need to report? What type of verification they might need? Um, you know, do you need something from a doctor, et cetera? Um, 
in terms of um, you know, being exempt on the basis of medical frailty. Um, there are also requirements for uh, reasonable accommodations um, um, for individuals uh, with disabilities. Uh, we'll be watching to see what's happening with those, how many are requested, and what types of um, policies are in place to respond in terms of reasonable modifications. Um, and certainly, uh, you know, we're doing our analysis and talking to stakeholders on the ground because we are interested in what's happening with uh, the formal evaluations that will take place, but those, um, um, and we'll want to see what happens and what the assessment is of the impact on um, people with disabilities, but um, those evaluations often take a long time. So it is important to um, see what's going on on the ground um, prior to the um, formal evaluations being done. So I'm just going to end there. We have a lot of um, uh, data. We have some state-by-state -state data on our website related to work. We have a number of reports. Um, we have the waiver tracker. Um, so those are just uh, some of the resources. And I just want to make sure we leave enough time if anyone has any questions that I can try to answer. OK, great. Thank you. Um, Let's see, let me, I think you talked about those, um, those questions. So again, question and answer. Uh, you can go down to the Zoom Q&A and uh, uh, Robin, I don't know if you can uh, see the, the Q&A, um, uh, but, uh, Right now, there's none open that are relevant to your question. Um, so let me ask a question. Uh, typically, I'll ask questions uh, until, until other folks start to chime in. So uh, in terms of, of, I'll go to the, the last one that, that came to mind was the reasonable accommodations question. Uh, the reason why, was that reasonable accommodations in terms of employment or in terms of being able to manage uh, the program requirements, the reporting requirements uh, for people with disability? You know, so it can be very onerous, as you mentioned, to, to maintain um, uh, benefits because of the reporting requirements. Is the accommodations discussion around that or around employment itself? Um, I believe it, it's applicable to both. Um, I mean, it happens, I mean, it, it, the way that the waiver is implemented or the way that these waivers um, would be implemented varies by state. Um, the first state and what we are following the most closely about what's happening with Arkansas, um, they are um, um, uniquely requiring individuals to create this account and go on um, uh, the only way they could do that is um, uh, reporting is online the yeah. state does have these you know registered reporters um, who can help individuals uh, comply with the reporting um, but I believe that the accommodations would be applicable to both the reporting as well as to um, complying with the, the work requirements. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, you know, I had, I have friends whose daughter uh, is an adult uh, with a disability. Uh, so, so their daughter, these parents are two PhD economists and they can never uh, they have so much difficulty supporting their daughter and filing all the paperwork. And, um, uh, you know, if you ever go over in terms of earnings in a given month, it, it can be deadly in terms of the paperwork that you have to file to, to kind of uh, handle that situation. Um, no questions yet. So another question I have, and, and um, Denise, uh, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask them or any, any of the other panelists or UNH and Kessler folks. So another question I have is about uh, the, the Arkansas. Arkansas, you've said there's kind of three months of experience with it. Um, uh, some similar to uh, TANF uh, and um, 
the change to TANF and the uh, earned income tax credit uh, back in welfare reform, uh, there was a real push to to have people uh, go on to SSI, right? Uh, are you seeing any discussions or uh, is there any evidence from Arkansas that the number of SSI applications have gone up? Um, I think it probably is early um, um, for that type of experience um, and to to get a to get a handle on that. I mean, the state is the state already does have um, a process by which they determine individuals who are medically frail, um, and they are. Um, excluded from participation in, um, you know, in the private option or the premium assistance in the QHP program. Um, so the state has a process to identify some individuals who are medically frail and the state is doing a data match and will automatically, um, uh, you know, um, exempt those individuals from the requirements but the question is you know how many other individuals might um have a disability might have um uh, a reason that they cannot um meet the work or reporting requirements that are not captured in that initial yeah. medical frailty um determination yeah yeah for sure um, it might be so you you I, I'm flipping through your charts. I don't know if you can see me playing around with the charts. So I'm looking at the state charts uh, at the eight pending states. Um, uh, you know, and then of course, so New Hampshire's. I'm in, sitting in New Hampshire right now. Um, can you tell me a little bit about about? Oh, actually, I have another question. So uh, is NA not applicable or not available for the 39 states? Oh, um, right. It's uh, not applicable in terms of um, states that have submitted waivers to CMS. But again, I, you know, there are discussions going on, um, you know, certainly uh, Oklahoma, South Carolina, um, Missouri, uh, Michigan had a debate, uh, Minnesota, there was state legislative debate. So um, the issue is um, certainly under discussion in, um, in state legislatures um, and a number of other states might be thinking about um, developing these type of waivers, but they just haven't been submitted. Yeah. Um, what, have, what have the states, have the states, has it uniformly been uh, similar wages, or I'm sorry, not wages, uh, hours. Do they have any hour? What is the hours requirement on work? Do you know? Um, yeah, we do have um, uh, on the our waiver tracker where um, you know show the population as well as the um, um, as the hours. And there is one state. Um, most of them are um, requirements for 80 hours. Um, um, per month, there's one state that is a um, hundred, and I, I'm it might be New Hampshire. Uh, um, yeah. So, Denise, on the same in the same way, Robin, um, is there a difference in how they are defining? Because I know most of these say able body. That's what they're. And when you read the press reports about all of this, what you see is, um, you know, it only covers able-bodied people. And so, and I think that's one of the reasons the disability community has not tuned into this in an intense way yet. Are they defining able-bodied differently by state? How is yeah, that? Yeah, I mean, just on the previous question, it is um, New Hampshire that has um, the hours required are 100 hours per month. So that's higher than <clears throat> many of the other states that are either 80 hours a month or um, 20 hours, uh, um, 20 hours a week. Um, so, and it, it is, right, this is, um, the language is that, you know, this, particularly with the expansion, even though there are many non-expansion states that are pursuing similar policies, 
Um, there were many, um, quote, able-bodied individuals who became eligible for coverage, um, so they should be working. And, you know, all the states have a list of um, uh, exemptions and how, you know, they're a long list of exemptions. So they say if you're working, you know, you should be fine, or if you, you know, are not able-bodied, you should be fine. Um, I think that there are um, questions about, right, these exemptions. Um, so even if you are technically exempt, how do you apply for that exemption? And, um, yes. um, you know, how is that process, you know, how can individuals navigate that process? Um, and how often do they need to report? So there's, you know, a lot of issues um, um, there. And again, even if you are technically exempt, um, you still have to potentially do that reporting, so you still could be subject um, to coverage loss if you can't navigate that process. So it is not really that you're not affected because you still, even if you have an exemption, um, you would need to do that reporting um, to show that you have, you know, you're meeting that exemption. Yeah, that's, and I think that's the point is, depending on what state you're from, you may, that is going to be defined differently. And, you know, if this is something you're looking into, you want to go, it's a very state specific, um, and you're going to need to check with your Medicaid Bureau, et cetera, et cetera. Um, all the way around, it's a, it makes for a, um, I mean, in some ways, it's a difficult national conversation to have because they differ by state from the policy point of view. So there's right. another. They differ, but I think the issues are similar. That no matter what the process is, when you look at the literature, having a process and having to do additional documentation, um, you know, generally uh, results in um, in problems main obtaining or maintaining coverage. Yeah, absolutely. If I was not clear on that, absolutely, um, it is a problem no matter where it exists. Um, yeah. Thank you. And that's, I think, what, exactly what your slides are showing. So we have a question coming in from uh, uh, folks online. So uh, do states have to specify a certain reason or exemption for the waiver? If so, are states providing similar reasons for requesting a waiver? So what's the rationale? What, what, are, they, what are they talking about when they try to implement these waivers? Um, yeah, so one of um, um, the rationales, and this was in the, um, <clears throat> the guidance put forth by CMS, is that um, uh, work is positively associated um, with health, um, and work relates to, um, to independence. Um, we have another literature review that we just um, put out that looks at that relationship between work and health. Um, um, and again, that was part of um, uh, what the ruling was in Kentucky um, that really the um, purpose of the Medicaid program is to provide um, affordable medical coverage and to the extent that the projections show that some of these um, provisions would, um, uh, you know, would impact that coverage. That was one of the issues cited in the court case um, in Kentucky for invalidating the waiver. Um, so there are those arguments included in the administration's um, guidance to states and promoting these objectives. And I think that that is part of the crux of what's um, um, uh, going on in terms of the litigation. And again, we have a broader, I'm sure I could send that around, um, um, a broader literature review that more carefully looks at that relationship between um, work and health. And it, right. you know, pretty clearly shows from looking at a, um, a large body of uh, research that there's, um, limited evidence on the effect of employment on health. Um, yeah. So um, um, 
Um, so, uh, but all of those studies are uh, captured in that report. That sounds good. Uh, we'll make that available to folks uh, and also uh, your contact information uh, is at the end. Uh, we we're running quickly out of time, but just to plug uh, your figure 33 um, uh, that I have on up on the screen now, it would be interesting to see what disability types uh, are in the 57% of that 30%. Um, uh, you know, and and you could potentially use the the self care disability question and the independent living disability difficulty questions as kind of severity markers. Um, uh, and so it would be it would be interesting to see those groups. My guess is that they're probably people who are a little bit uh, uh, towards you know nearing retirement age. So. In any event, thank you, Robin, for, for your great uh, presentation. This is, I really, I really love all the statistics. Oops, I, I've been playing around a little bit with the uh, PowerPoint, and I always get in trouble. Um, so anyway, uh, thank you, Robin, and thank you, everybody. It's now uh, 1 o'clock. It's time to go. So uh, thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Oh, I'm doing it wrong again. I'm fired. Hello, and welcome everybody to the National Hello, Trends and Dis- welcome. I'm trying to get to the last slide. <laughs> oh, this is terrible. Let's <laughs> go.